It's time for another episode of Corner of the Galaxy from the Box. The show that gets you behind the scenes of the LA Galaxy and into the minds of soccer reporters and MLS experts. Your hosts for the day are Corner of the Galaxy's Josh Gessman and LA Times soccer reporter Kevin Baxter. Let's start the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Corner of the Galaxy from the box on cornerofthegalaxy.com. Mr. Josh Gessman and Mr. Kevin Baxter with you once again. Glad to be with you at the beginning of another LA Galaxy week. Lots of uh, stuff going on this week. Two games for the LA Galaxy coming up this week. Two preseason games to sort of close out the preseason schedule. So uh, a lot of stuff will be leading to that. But, uh, Kevin, we have, we have a lot to get to. There's a lot of things to talk about. Um, as is always the case with our shows here. But, I mean, first of all, we, we I guess we should at least start by acknowledging the fact the LA Galaxy did play a preseason game uh, behind closed doors up in Santa Barbara on Saturday um, and that they won that game 2 to nothing. So that's that would be a positive step in the, in the right direction for the LA Galaxy. That's what I've heard. I didn't actually see it because it was behind closed doors. So if a Galaxy team wins a game in the forest and no one sees it, did it really happen? Yeah, I know. That's always, we'll, that's we'll always the question. We'll take the word for it. Yeah, yeah. We'll um, take the word for it. We had uh, goals from Dos Santos in the 40th minute, McBean in the 85th minute. The first team scored a goal, which if everybody was worried about that, the first team hadn't scored a goal. They have now done that. Uh, Dos Santos there. It looked like Ari Lasseter actually got the start um, up top with Giovanni Dos Santos in this particular game. Joao Pedro got an assist in this game as well. Uh, they played on turf, which in, in this case, Kevin, might have been a good thing with all the rain that uh, California, Southern California, Northern California got on Friday. Um, maybe if it was real grass, it wouldn't have worked, but uh, they got the game in. They did their job. Jack McBean came in with the second stringers. Uh, the starters went 61 minutes. I mean, this is this is what we can take from this. I, I don't know that there was there's anything else that anybody could take from this uh, besides that it looked like Romain Alessandrini, um, at least whenever they were getting ready to play this game, was getting ready to arrive in Los Angeles, and we now have uh, confirmation that he had his first training session on Monday with the LA Galaxy. So, I mean, that's sort of the the couple of things that have happened in the last couple of days to, to sort of move us along in the preseason, Kevin. Um now we, we sort of start to take stock of the preseason. Have we seen it? Do we know anything yet about the LA Galaxy in this preseason? Uh, no, we know that they still need a right back, and it uh, looks like uh, Rafa's going to get that, uh, Rafael Garcia. So that is uh, the Galaxy now admitting that Robbie Rogers will not be ready for the season opener. So um, they uh, turn their focus on, on replacing him. The other thing, too, you know, there are two other, other players who may may or may not play in the first game. The Galaxy insists that Giassi's artists and uh, Romain Alessandrini will be ready for the opener. Um, and uh, I, I'm a, a little bit more skeptical. And the reason I am is uh, Alessandrini has not started a game since November. And, and although he did play uh, Marseille, he, he hasn't trained in three weeks. And I think it's a little difficult. I know he trained today. Today was his first training session. And he's supposed to play in the, in the exhibition tomorrow at noon. Uh, then we'll play again Saturday. But I don't know whether he has enough time to get uh, accustomed to his teammates and to be fully fit. And that'll be a curt and awful decision. Um, you know, there's a, a little bit of an extra gap between the Galaxy's first two games. There's eight days. And one of the things I've always heard from coaches and in every sport is when a player is healthy um, for a particular game, generally you give him one more day, one more game to get ready. Because in the case of the Galaxy, you play these guys in the first game, uh, and they play one, and then they're out for 30, the, the other 33 games of the season because they weren't ready and they got hurt. So, uh, you know, Giassi Zardes hasn't played in a game since August because of the broken bone in his foot, and now he had the knee operation. So um, Galaxy says both those guys will be ready. Allison Drini trained today. Giassi Zardes has not trained with the first team uh, since August. Uh, you know, I think that uh, Kurnanoff would be wise to give those guys – the first game off and have them ready for the second game, but that's not my decision. We'll see what happens. FC Dallas is the, the uh, opponent in the opener. They're my pick to win MLS, so it's going to be a very difficult game. Um, and 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 maybe you you look at that and roll the dice and say if these guys are fit enough to train, they're fit enough to play in the game. Yeah, I mean that's sort of that's sort of where it goes now. Uh, whether or not Giassi is actually ready, we've already talked about Robbie Rogers, and we're going to talk about him a lot more as uh, you actually got to talk with him here, Kevin. But ultimately, it all comes down to who is going to be ready on this team and who is not. And we have talked about the depth of the LA Galaxy and the fact that the starting lineup. Uh, I think you and I both agree the starting lineup, if everybody's healthy, is a good starting lineup, and the team should be able to compete in Major League Soccer. I mean, quite honestly, they have some things fall their way and get a little depth behind them and I see them actually probably making a pretty strong case for themselves but 
if players get hurt. And last year, one of the things I think we talked about all the time, Kevin, was, you know, when the LA Galaxy get healthy, when the LA, when Steven Gerrard is healthy, when Robbie Keane is healthy, this team is going to be pretty good. And ultimately, that never happened throughout the entire course of the year. And you're already starting that way with the, with the, you know, in this preseason where you look at Zardis being injured and Robbie Rogers being injured, and you're hopeful that those are two absolute lock starters if they're healthy. Um, you need them on this team in order for this team to even start to perform to what we possibly think they could. You know, but it, and looking at the people that are available and the guys that have played in these exhibitions so far, um, Yes, Jesse Zard is going to be missed. I'm not going to say that uh, they can replace him easily, but you know they do have Ari Lasser, they do have uh, Jack McBean, um, guys that can come in and fill in for a game. So I don't think it's the end of the world if Jesse Zardes needs to miss one more game. I think again you want to have him healthy for 33 games and not just one. And the other thing is he's going to wind up missing a lot of time uh, during the season with uh, the national team. So. He's going to need to be fit and strong all season, not just for one game. So if if he's not ready to go 110 uh, percent, I don't think the Galaxy uh, would be uh, hurt greatly by by using Jack McBean or Ari Lasseter. I kind of feel the same way about Alessandrini, especially if he is not on the same page with his teammates. That a midfield of uh, Ima Boateng, Jermaine Jones, Sebastian Legette, um, uh you know, may not you know, and and Jao Pedro, that may not be the worst thing in the world either. Um, if there is one position uh, where the Galaxy don't have a starter uh, ready to go that could be hurt, uh, I think it's right back. I think, uh, you know, the teams are going to run right at Rafa Garcia. He's a, a midfielder. He's not a, a right back. He's learning to play that position. He may turn out to be very good. You know, again, I have to keep going back and saying if we had this discussion last year and we were talking about Daniel Steris, we'd all say, oh, my gosh, you know, the Galaxy really need to get Leonardo back there. They need a, another center back. Well, Daniel Starris turned out to be pretty good. So, you know, maybe Rafael Garcia can do that too. But I think at the beginning, the very first game, Jack McBean up front, you know, not the end of the world, starting those four guys in the midfield we just talked about instead of Allison Drini. Not a bad uh, fallback plan. Uh, right back is, a, you know, I, I think still Rafa has to prove himself. Yeah, it's going to be uh, interesting to see how that goes. All right, now we move on to Kevin. You got to talk to Robbie Rogers. He dropped the puck at an L.A. Kings game. You got to talk to him, I think, was it before the game or was it uh, or, or was it after he dropped the puck? When did you get to uh, talk to him exactly? No, it was before the game, and uh, he wasn't sure what the whole puck drop thing was about. If you've never been to a hockey game, it's not like the ceremonial first pitch. It's even kind of a little goofier. Basically what happens is the, 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 the first – Puck, a celebrant, uh, walks out on a on a carpet out to center ice, uh, so he doesn't actually touch the ice and just drops the puck between the two captains who pretend to face off, uh, and then everyone smiles and poses for a picture, and and uh, Robbie leaves the ice. So he wasn't really sure what that was all about. It wasn't a big deal. I just told him to protect his ankle. Um, right. What we did talk about though is. Um, it, you know, he'd been missing from training. The, the team never really said anything about it. I asked the team. I had heard report that he had been in the hospital this winter, and I said, you know, has, is he missing training because he's been in the hospital in the last month? And the response was, he hasn't been in the hospital in the last month, which just sort of piqued my curiosity because they, they didn't say he hadn't been in the hospital, just he hasn't been there in the last four weeks. Right. So Robbie and I talked. He had off-season surgery uh, on his uh, ankle, and then – on December 22nd, he had to he rushed back to the emergency room and needed another um, uh, what he called an emergency operation to clean out the ankle. Um, after that emergency operation, he said he had a weird reaction to an injection um, when he got the ankle cleaned out, and uh, it's caused some nerve problems in his foot. And it's his left foot, and he said he still has no feeling in, in, in much of his left foot. Some of it's returning a little bit. Um, but there's no feeling there. He, for a while, he considered retirement, and then uh, he said that kind of passed, and he just realized he was he was freaking out a little bit. That was right. his; those were his words. But you know, he just adopted a, a son who turned one over the weekend. Uh, he's thinking beyond soccer. He's thinking about what happens going forward, and he said it it, it continues to to crop up in his mind. What if I, I have no feeling in my left foot? How is this going to affect my life? I'm only 29, going forward. Um, you know, what do I need to do? So he is he is in the weight room. He's lifting weights. He's said he's doing very light running on the treadmill, although he said that's very difficult to do because you can't feel you know, without feeling in your foot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're he said you're a little uncoordinated. And he's also seeing a neurologist in Santa Monica. Um, there is no time frame at this point of when he might be back. You know, they, they've made when we spoke last week, they had made little headway in, in getting the, uh, the feeling back in his foot. So 
you know, once that happens, then he needs a couple of weeks, obviously, to get fit and ready. And, and they're not anywhere close to setting the timeline for that. Um, so right now his career is just kind of in limbo. And he, one of the things he did say, we talked about A.J. De La Garza, of course. And, you know, my question to him was, if this happened on December 22nd, clearly the team knew um, that you were not healthy when they traded A.J. De La Garza. And, and he said that that was true, but um, he kind of pulled back a little bit saying, look, after an operation, and he's had eight operations in his career, by the way, um, most for lower legs. He said, after right. an operation, sometimes it takes two, three, sometimes even four weeks to get the feeling back, and that's totally normal. He said, this is the first time the feeling hasn't come back. So it, if you look at his timeline, December 22nd, the operation, um, uh, so 11 days to the end of the year, well, nine days to the end of the year, and 13 days until De La Garce was traded. So that's three weeks. That's within that window where the, the Galaxy and, and Robbie Rogers obviously felt like, yeah, this is a little bit slower than normal, but but Robbie will be ready for the opening of training camp, and he wasn't. And now Rafa Garcia looks like he's the opening day right back. Yeah, I, I mean, that is the interesting part here is that, um, you know, I, I thought I took a couple things from your article, and you and I had been talking about this for a while. Um, we had heard some rumors about, you know, what was going on and things like that, and just trying to figure out exactly what was going on. But you, you sit there and you go, okay, this is eight surgeries. I mean, that number popped out at me right away is that this is his eighth surgery. And you, you know, Robbie has had, you know, different surgeries, but whenever you actually start counting them and adding them up and, and that there's eight of them, that's, that's a lot. And, and we've known about sort of his durability in the past that, um, you know, he came into, whenever he came to the LA galaxy, uh, whenever he was, uh, his, his rights were acquired, whenever they traded Mike McGee to Chicago and the LA galaxy got his rights. Uh, he came into the LA galaxy and started training and then promptly got hurt. Um, so, I mean, there, he's been hurt, a bunch of times uh, throughout his career. And so it's, again, it's a little bit questionable to me how you can think that there is, uh, there's no backup behind Robbie Rogers. I mean, that seems like that's the obvious thing right now is that there's no depth behind him. And if you do that, then how can you move AJ De La Garza? And I'm not of the opinion that AJ De La Garza had to be moved, Kevin. That doesn't, that doesn't no, but, seem but to you me. D but you, you did like the trade, though. I think a lot of us did. Uh, um, you know, they, they, they cleared about 500000 in cap money, both money they got. And then, and then and AJ's then, salary. Uh, yeah. Moving, yep. moving AJ's salary. And, and that did, it didn't directly turn into Jao Pedro and, and Allison Drini, but, or not, excuse me, Jermaine Jones. But certainly that TAM money helped get those two guys. So if you're the Galaxy, you look at it and you probably say, we got Jermaine Jones and, and, uh, and uh, Jao Pedro. We got two starters in the midfield in exchange for our, our number five defender, um, that looks like a good deal. But going forward now, all of a sudden, as you mentioned, Robbie Rogers is a durability issue to start with. So he's probably, you probably pen him in for 24 starts, not 34. So, you know, we've already got to replace him for 10 games. Uh, there may be another injury somewhere. We have a guy like AJ De La Garza that can play all four positions. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I think the Galaxy knew it was a gamble. They rolled the dice. And it just, it's already bit him in the butt, and we haven't even started the season yet. Yeah, I know. It's sort of one of those things. Now, granted, you know, Rafa Garcia, like we said, is going to be, looks like that right back starter on, on opening day. And he could turn out to be a great right back. I, I said it in my uh, live show last Thursday that, you know, Rafa Garcia, I bet if you walked up to him now and asked him, like, you know, what position would he, he's like, he's like, I'm a right back now. You know, his, his mind and his mentality is, I'm a right back and I'm going to learn everything I can, and I'm going to be the best right back that there is because that seems to be his attitude. And that's one of the reasons I've always loved talking to him or seeing him play is that you know his attitude is whatever the team wants whatever the team needs that's what I will be and so Rafa Garcia could turn out to be a right back converted you know Robbie Rogers was a midfielder whenever the LA Galaxy got him and now he's a, you know and then he was a left back and now he's a right back um, yeah. so it's not unheard of to take these guys it just seems like it was a bigger gamble than perhaps the LA Galaxy needed to be and you know Kevin you said you know AJ's the the number five guy you know the uh, of the four defensive positions he's like the fifth guy he's the first guy off the bench for one of those positions but realistically and I was always scratching my head throughout last year I kept wondering why AJ De La Garza was not playing as a starter over Robbie Rogers, because quite honestly, in my mind, AJ De La Garza is a better defender and gives you about as much going forward as Robbie Rogers does. Well, a couple of things. First of all, you know, when you look at AJ De La Garza, he could play all four positions very well. Um, LA, LA Galaxy has a really good roster, and they have had one for a few years. Players like Yop and Ari Lasseter and Jack McBean and Raul Mendiola, you know, Dave Romney came from there, Daniel Saris. The problem with a lot of those guys is they looked at the the first team where they wanted to be, and there was no openings. A guy like I say, Raul Mendiola, 
probably thought he deserved a shot on the first team, and the Galaxy goes out and signs uh, Steven Gerrard, and they go out and get uh, Nigel Jong. And the guys down at Galaxy 2 were saying, you know what, uh, when am I going to get my shot? Well, okay, Rafa Garcia gets his shot right now, and I think you're right when you say he's embraced this and he considers himself a right back. You know why? Because the Galaxy have said, right now, you're our right back unless you you know, the job is yours for now unless you lose it. And I think all those guys on Galaxy 2 wanted something like that. And and, and I guess that underlies my point a little bit about uh, maybe starting Jack McBean and, and uh, Ima Boateng in that first game and, and let Alison Drini and, and Jesse's artists get healthy because those guys on Galaxy 2, young, talented players, all they want is a shot and right. for someone to say, go out there and show me what you can do. Rafa Garcia got that. Daniel Sturz got it last year. You know, we could be really surprised with those guys. I mean, I, I, you know, I think there's a chance that those guys definitely are talented enough that they could seize this opportunity. And at this point next year, we'll be talking about who was the right back before Rafa Garcia. Yeah, exactly. It very well could. I mean, listen, that's how things happen, too, in the sports world. Let's not pretend for a second that things don't change and revelations aren't made during the season. I mean, you either sometimes you find out guys who were really bad, poor the year before are really good and have a breakout year. And, you know, some of the times you find the guys who were really good last year who you're going to depend on uh you know are injured or they're not going to be able to perform to that same level and I think that's one of the questions that maybe we have about somebody like Giovanni Dos Santos who really needs to have a repeat performance of what he did last year especially being he's going to be the man quote unquote the man this year and so you you look at the different things that need to come out of those players and players that need to have good years and I think that's something we're going to talk about a little later is you know who besides I think we both talked about Sebastian Legette clearly has probably the most upside right now in 2017 for the LA Galaxy but who else is going to be a surprise this season if we can you know prognate prognosticate that or or predict that maybe maybe we're, we're way smarter than we think we are but at the same time it's like something like that's going to have to happen you have to have guys who outperform what you think they're going to do. And the bottom line is that right now we don't know who though even who those guys might be. And Rafa Garcia could be that guy who outperforms what we think he could do. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think that he's one. I'm going to mention a guy that I, I know this is not in the spirit of the question, but you brought him up. Um, you know, Giovanni Dos Santos, one thing I, I like about him is, you know, we, we talked about how Sebastian Legette got a boost of confidence from being on the national team. He really hasn't you know, he's just as fast and just as skillful as he probably was before. But that boost of confidence has really made him a different player. You know, in following Gio's career, he's always been in somebody else's shadow. With the national team down in Mexico, he came up at the same time pretty much as Javier Hernandez. And he was always the guy that was in Chicharito's shadow. And then uh, Peralta and others came along. And Gio was always trying to find his way and 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 draw attention to himself. I think he's a player that that uh, um, you know that really does enjoy the attention and, and enjoys, like you said, being the man. So he comes to the Galaxy and he has to defer to Robbie Keane and then Steven Gerrard. And, you know, I think you're right. I think this is his team, um, and I think he's ready for it. In, in talking to him a couple times this winter, he seems like a much more mature guy than he was in the past, and I think that comes from he's getting the opportunity. He's always wanted. We talk about Rafa Garcia. Gio's getting the opportunity to be the man, but – I, I, I understand that that's not in the spirit. You were talking about someone that we haven't seen before, and I, I agree with that. I think Rafa Garcia, um, I think with the midfield going to miss so many games, Jermaine Jones and Sebastian Lejet going off to the national team, you know, Bajo Husidic has been a really solid guy. I think he sort of, he, he steps up a little bit in importance too, and Raul Mendiola got a taste of play last year. Right. Um, I think he's going to have a good season. And then finally, the guy I would mention would be uh, a guy that can go either way. And we'll have to see. I think Ima Boateng showed flashes of brilliance last year and also made some really harebrained mistakes. Um, that's a guy that is going to change the game when he comes on, sometimes for your team and sometimes for the other team. But, right. uh, you know, if, if he can sort of uh, minimize the mistakes, his, his, that speed that he has and, and his ability as a playmaker, it's pretty amazing. I, I, I would expect to see some really good things from Ima, Ima Boateng as well. Yeah, I mean, he's probably number one on my list of the guys who could be surprising enough, Kevin, that, that, that really needs to step up is, is Emmanuel Boateng. And even I think that he's going to get a lot more playing time because you have to count on everybody staying healthy. And if one person goes down in the midfield, 
um, in the center of midfield, either either Pedro or you know more than likely probably Jermaine Jones at his age. If if you're gonna guess who's gonna get hurt, it, it's probably gonna be Jones. Um, and, you know, Sebastian Lejet has to move to the inside. You know, that brings Emmanuel Boateng off the bench and into a starting role. And what you can get for him either off the bench as sort of that game changer with speed, or as a starter, you you need consistency and you need for him to outperform what he did last year. He needs to play every game in 2017 like he played against Real Salt Lake in 2016. Who I don't know what whether it was just the color of the, of the kits that RSL wears, maybe that that red or what do they we even call it? I don't know, it, what is it the cobalt and blue? I, I don't even I, I don't know what colors they have, but they they always have a different name for it. But whatever that color is, we need to like wave that in front of Emo whenever he's playing because for whatever reason he torches Real Salt Lake uh, and then you know had some good games against other people, but ultimately you saw his height and what he was able to do against RSL last year, and you need to see more of that. I, I think another guy, for me, who needs to either perform to the same level or actually raise his level, and especially being he's going to have Rafa Garcia starting next to him at the beginning, is Daniel Starris has to have a surprisingly good season, just like he did last year, which I think it was a a good, solid season. He made a lot of mistakes, Kevin, and people are quick to point that out. Uh, a lot of people think that AJ De La Garza should have started in his position uh, instead of Daniel Starris being in that spot, and there's one of the reasons that AJ got moved to the bench. And for me, I always wanted AJ in Robbie Rogers' position, position and I liked what Daniel Starris did, but I, I think I'm in the minority with that. But Starris has to have a ridiculously good year to back up the year that he had last year. And you talked about it, Kevin. You said that Curtin Alfa was already talking to these guys like Yellow Van Damme um, and like Daniel Starris and saying, listen, last year's over. This year, we need the same performance. You need to, be, need to be just as hungry as you were last year, even more so this year, because we don't have as much room for error. At least that's my little injection there. Is we don't have as much room for error this year if you're the LA Galaxy because the depth isn't there. We need better performances out of those starting 11. And quite honestly, unlike Bruce Arena, where, Kevin, we never knew what the starting lineup was going to be with Kurt Anolfo, when everybody is healthy, there should be no doubts in anybody's mind, I think, of who the starting 11 is going to be for the LA Galaxy. Well, a couple of things there. You know, I like I like Ima Boateng. I like him as sort of the Alan Gordon of this year's team. You know, uh, Alan Gordon was the guy that played so well in the air. He changed the way uh, the Galaxy approached uh, their offense, you know, the way they approach their attack. And so you'd bring him in for the last 10 or 15 minutes. The, the idea is he couldn't go a full 90 minutes. You bring him in at the end of the game and he changes the way teams have to defend the Galaxy. I, I think with Ema, you bring him in quite a bit earlier. He comes in in maybe the 60th minute, but his speed changes everything. And I really like him off the bench. And I see him as that game changer guy. Yes, if he's the best midfielder available, yeah, I guess you do start him and he has to play 90 minutes. But I think that takes away. It's just like, a, you know, in baseball, a guy like Araldus Chapman throws 102 miles an hour. So he's a great closer. Well, if he's the best closer, why not start him? Well, because he can't throw 102 miles an hour for nine innings. And I, I see Ima Boateng kind of in the same way. But, you know, you're right. I did talk to Kurt Anoffel about uh, his offseason conversation with Daniel Starris. And, you know, he, he didn't mention Sebastian, but I, I think maybe we can and say, like, Sebastian's first year, especially his first month, um, he was so successful. I wonder if he came back for the second year as hungry, whether he felt like he's got this thing nailed, he, everything is okay, he didn't have to work as hard, and he didn't have as strong a season, I thought, last year as he did the first year. And, uh, you know, now his game has changed, obviously, with the call-ups and national team. Kurt Anoffel was kind of aware of that possibility and went to Daniel Steris and said, you know, everybody knows who you are now. You proved yourself. Um but you worked so hard to get to that position. You need to work even harder to stay there. And and that's what a lot of players in all sports will tell you. You know, succeeding isn't as hard as continuing to succeed. Um, you're right. He's he's de next to Yellow Van Dam, who had a great first season and needs to repeat that as well. But uh, Yellow Van Dam is such a veteran guy. He is going to be the captain this year, I think. Right. Um, yes. And he's going to be next to uh, Steris, and I expect him to be the coach on the field. I think he's really going to help Daniel. Maybe last year he didn't feel as comfortable until the end of the season. Maybe he didn't feel as comfortable calling the shots on the defensive line. I think that's gone, and I think uh, Yella is really going to um, – um, uh, you know, step up and be noticed, and he's going to be the guy that's going to run that. You know, much as uh, Omar Gonzalez used to do. I remember when Tommy Meyer, the, Omar used to sort of to tell him where to go and, and help him with his game. I expect Daniel Sturz to get a lot of help from Yella Van Dam this year. And and the fact, 
Kurt Anoff was already zeroed in on this, like, hey, this is the issue that we need to to worry about with these guys, I think is a real uh, positive thing for the galaxy. Yeah, it is. And if you, you go back to guys who were, you know, good leaders, you go back to Greg Berhalter, sort of teaching uh, Omar Gonzalez and AJ De La Garza whenever they both came into the league in 2009, sort of how to, how to be an MLS defender, and that worked out well for both of those guys. So, yeah, I mean, it's important for Yellow Van Dam to impart, again, more knowledge to Daniel Stairs than he even did last year. Um, and Daniel Stairs has to have a year without very many mistakes because, uh, again, he's going to be playing, and if I'm any team, I'm attacking up the left-hand side on my team, the right-hand side of the LA Galaxy's defense, uh, towards Rafa Garcia and towards Daniel Stairs. And whoever is going to be that midfielder, which probably could be Sebastian Legette with Romain Alessandrini on the left-hand side, I expect Legette to play on the right-hand side. Uh, regardless of the fact, that's the weaker side. And so, you know, you're going to want to attack uh, Sebastian Legette, especially whenever he gets forward. You want that counter to be quick. Uh, you want to go after Rafa Garcia because he has a tendency right now in preseason to get sucked in on that near side and allow too much space on that outside. And this is all stuff that he's going to have to learn. And then he's right next to Daniel Stairs, who, again, is no MLS veteran by any any means, right? I think, uh, what is, uh, Stairs is 27? Is he 25, 27? Yeah, he's but he older. did have this. Did have that time with Seattle. He's been around right. a little bit, but as far yeah. as game experience, he's just got the one year. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So he, he's an older older kid, but still, um, you know, just just not as experienced there in that position. So he has all that stuff. So that's the part. Obviously, you're not. And again, this is all this is easy to say whenever we're standing back here. But you're not going to attack at Yellow Van Dam and Jermaine Jones through the middle and have to go off to the LA Galaxy's left defensive side against Ashley Cole and Yellow Van Dam and Jermaine Jones. And, you know, I mean, that, that triangle over there starts to get pretty interesting, and, you know, that's going to be the real strength of the LA Galaxy defense. It's going to be on the other side where it's obvious that you're going to want to attack. So that's going to be how that works. Uh, but with Robbie Rogers and having a completely unknown timetable for, for return, Kevin, that's... That's where this gets interesting. I know we're talking about players who are going to have big years. Um, quite honestly, a guy who needs to have a big year for the LA Galaxy is Robbie Rogers. And with this injury and an unknown timetable, time that is putting already the 2017 season sort of in jeopardy in the very beginning. And, and people are going to say that maybe that's a pessimistic view. But we've seen sort of, you know, we have to right now look at these teams on paper, Kevin, because we've only seen, you know, one or two preseason games. There's a closed door scrimmage. I didn't see him play in San Jose. I've seen, you know, basically a, a almost starting team play 45 minutes against the Jolos, and I've watched highlights of other things. That, that's about all we've seen. And we're going to get a chance to see the LA Galaxy coming up. Um, closed door scrimmage on Tuesday. I may actually be there. Uh, so that way I can watch that. Or And then the LA Galaxy will come home and host the Portland Timbers, which, of course, is not a closed-door preseason game, but the last game of the preseason on Saturday at 8 p.m. That's Saturday, February 25th. So that's the one everybody's going to want to get out to and watch. But So we're going to get to see basically what we expect to be, I think, the starting lineup for LA Galaxy versus FC Dallas. I expect that we'll see our first bit of Romain Alessandrini. We'll obviously see our first bit of uh, Joao Pedro at home uh, for at StubHub Center there. So you're going to start to get an idea of what this team could do, but it doesn't feel like a finished product to me, Kevin. And it's it's it also still leaves me question marks with Giassi Zardes um, and possibly Alessandrini. Alessandrini is more of a, hey, whenever he can fit into the team, Kevin, he can fit into the team, and, and that's fine. I don't want to rush that, and that's not important. But with Zardes, hasn't played, realistically, hasn't played in MLS since August 27th of last year, whenever he he broke the foot. I think he actually broke the foot the game before, but he, he finally realized it was broken in that in that Vancouver game. Um, and so you look at that, and that starts to be a concern for me. And just the fact that, you know, there wasn't even any news about Zardis and his surgery is also concerning to me. Yeah, the, the Galaxy did not uh, offer any of that information up uh, ahead of time. And with Robbie Rogers, in, in, in a lot of ways, they were actually um, covering up information that they knew and that that bothers me as a journalist because when they sign a player or when a player comes back from injury they want you to write about it and talk about how great the team is but you know last year Robbie Keane's surgery found out about that from Robbie Keane's um, uh, social media account Robbie uh, Rogers uh, operation found out about that from the social media account uh, Giassi's artist broken foot found out about that from the U.S. national team none of that came from the galaxy um, and so you know I, I you know I think if they're going to want us to write about when they uh sign a player when a player comes back from injury uh, they need to let us know when a player goes out as well the Dodgers do that the Lakers do that everybody does that except apparently the Galaxy a couple of points though that you made earlier you know um, with Giazzi's artists 
rushing him back doesn't make sense because he already has the chemistry with these guys. He's played with Gio. He's played with Sebastian. He's played with Baggio. He's played with a lot of these guys. So he's so okay. But Alison Drini, I think he needs to get that chemistry. But I think the biggest thing with him and, and the reason why, in my mind, I think he'll play in the Saturday scrimmage, but he may be doubtful for the opener. Uh, when you talk to European players, they talk about how MLS may not be the most skilled, the uh, players may not be the most skilled in the world, and a skillful European player fit in very well. But MLS is a very physical league. It's very fast. They talk about the speed, and it's very physical as far as the contact. And so Alison Drini may come in and have the skills, but if he's not 100% fit, this league could eat him up. And so, you know, that's another thing I think Kurt Anoff was going to think about. And and finally, with, with Rafa Garcia, you were, you were sort of breaking that down. Worst case scenario with Rafa Garcia, he's a midfielder uh, naturally. Uh, I think he's going to want to charge up the field, which is what Robbie Rogers did, and then that's what the Galaxy want him to do. But he's going to be really susceptible to balls over the top because I think in his mind it's going to take him a while to realize he is the last line of the defense and he needs to get back. He's going to be really susceptible to balls over the top. Once that happens a couple of times, all of a sudden you have Steris moving over to cover that gap. That leaves the middle open. You have some of the midfielders saying, we don't, we're don't. we going to drop back instead of push forward because we need to cover that gap on the right side. Um, and all of a sudden, there's a there's a big hole between the midfield and the and the strikers, and there's a lot of territory. You know, do you want your guys making 30 yard passes? So, how Rafa Garcia plays, and whether he is able to to make that adjustment and stop those uh, uh, balls from coming over the top, it's going to dictate how the Galaxy plays uh, all the rest of the field. I think. Yeah, it is interesting. I'll go back to the to you know sort of the injuries thing. I think I think one of the things that is interesting about Major League Soccer and is different than let's say the NBA or or Major League Baseball or even the NFL is that uh, those leagues, all the other leagues except for Major League Soccer, mandate that there is sort of an an injury report. Um, MLS used to kind of mandate that, and then they got away from it. And the fact that they don't have that right now really hurts any information from coming out because. Um, I don't know if I'm a team that I would ever want to release information that could be used, you know, in terms of if you could keep Jossie Zardis' surgery, you know, off the front page type thing, right, Kevin? Uh, you, you, you take away from the fact that maybe if he does play in the first game, that maybe it's not coming back from surgery or, or maybe he's not, you know, there isn't a weakness to him that maybe a team could use to exploit. And maybe there's not a weakness on your team that you could use to exploit. Although, you know, clearly there would be questions of why he wasn't training all the way up until, uh, you know, the start of the season, all of those things. But, I mean, do, do you think that's fair that, um, that, for the most part, all these teams see that information uh, in Major League Soccer as a competitive advantage, and they don't want to give that information away. Well, here's the thing. You've seen in the press box before every game, they hand us a package of, of information, stats, and things. And on the front is a little map of the uh, uh, what they call the Please. expected starting lineups for both teams. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I know a, 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 an MLS PR person that said that when he worked at another with another team, that he would actually try to figure out what the starting lineup might be. And um, the coaches came to him saying, "You're you're way too close to having the right starting lineup. We don't want the right starting lineup in there." And so my reaction to that was, "Well, then why even bother to do it if everyone in the league is agreeing ahead of time that this is not going to be the starting lineup? Why even yes. do that?" Yes. Um, the other part of that is. Um, I, I think it's giving us as reporters far too much credit to think that <laughs> teams are scouting through us. Um, you know, there are agents out there and there are other players and coaches. And you and I talk to different people, TV people and, and other journalists, and they give us insight. You know, we ask them about, hey, this guy looks to be injured or this guy, is he really going to resign? They all know that information. The agents and some of the other people that talk to these players they know that stuff. I don't think teams are scouting through us. I, I think, you know, a lot of people throughout the league knew from agents and other people what was going on with Giassi's artists and probably knew about Robbie Rogers as well. The only people that didn't know were the people that are around the Galaxy and Galaxy fans. And that's where I think the league owes it to its fans. If they're going to say, hey, come on out and see the season opener, come on out and see Giassi's artists and Robbie Rogers and the rest of the Galaxy when they know both those guys just had operations. Right. Um, or, or if they're not saying that, come out and see the Galaxy and come see Giassi's dos santos but by the way you're not going to see these guys i just think that does a disservice to the fans and and one of the things with the league you're right the league is is very much in this mode of never is heard a discouraging word you know when the the league almost went on strike a couple of years ago the, you know the people that wrote for the website were 
were uh, prohibited from even mentioning the fact that labor negotiations were going on. And I talked to fans who said, I spent thousands of dollars to book travel to the first game of the season. I had no idea it might not happen. To which the reply was, of course, well, you know, you got to broaden your s- source of information a little bit. But, uh, you know, I th- the problem with that, I think, is the league has a great story to tell. The Galaxy has a great story to tell. And part of that is struggling with injuries and struggling with uh, problems about ticket sales and all that. Don't tell me five years from now how great you are if you're not going to tell me now what, what, what's, what kind of problems you're having. It's all part of the same picture. I can't make you sound like a great league or a great team if I don't know – the struggles that you had to go through to get there. No, I, I think that's absolutely. This is this always shocks people. You know, realistically, I, I've and I've mentioned this many times before. I came to to, to covering soccer late. I mean, real. I, I didn't go to my first Galaxy game until 2008. Uh, I was there for 2009, which in my mind, and people are going to think I'm crazy. 2009 was the most fun experience I've ever had in my sporting life. All right, and the LA Galaxy went to MLS Cup and they lost to Real Salt Lake on penalty kicks. It was and it was up in Seattle, and I went to that game and I traveled and and I did all that stuff. I was I was there following. That was the most amazing thing that I've ever seen in terms of sports just because you understood how far the LA Galaxy had to come from 2008 and then 2009 to be that surprise and then to almost win MLS Cup kind of out of nowhere. Bruce Arena's first season, uh, you know, Omar Gonzalez, AJ De La Garza joined the team in 2009. All those things happened, but it was the struggles. And that's why in 2010, um, whenever the LA Galaxy fell short in the Western Conference uh, uh, playoffs there, um, and then in 2011 when everything finally clicked, 2011 was great because 2008, 2009, and 2010 happened. All right, there was disappointments all along that route until you get to 2011, where you get, you know, 2011, 2012, the back-to-back MLS Cups. You take a break in 2013, and you win in 2014. All of that makes sense and is miraculous. A lot of it because, Kevin, they struggled in 2008, uh, didn't make the playoffs, and then 2009 was that surprise year. So you have to understand that there's highs and lows, and I'm with you 100%. I think the league needs to really start to think about mandating these injury reports because it quite honestly it comes across as an amateur league when they don't do it um and even bruce arena whenever they did man uh, mandate it at one point was always trying to go around that and sort of figure out ways around it and i understand that coaches are going to do that but it needs to be just like the nfl has it just like um you know major league baseball nfl i think they have dedicated people who come and watch every single practice and they check off participated in practice, did not participate in practice, and and that way you know every single day who was in practice and who wasn't. And well, I, I don't think that we're at that level yet, Kevin, because I don't think you're going to have you know observers out there. They have to be like almost independent league observers out to every training that says, yes, this person's there, this person's not. And I also don't think that most of the reason that stuff was mandated was because of sports betting, and I don't know that Major League Soccer is at that level yet. Well, you know, to me it comes down to an honesty thing, and, and I'm going to go back to a couple of things that I've been personally involved with. Um, I wrote a story last year about the, the teams traveling uh, by commercial airlines and not charters. And, oh, my gosh, MLS came down so hard on me for that. And, and uh, it, you know, it was a really kind of ugly week for me. And MLS just was was so upset with that story. But you know what? It was 100% true. They never challenged the facts. And what was really interesting this year at MLS Media Day, they had 23 MLS players They came and spoke to us at Media Day, and there was one reporter in there that asked every one of them, what's the biggest problem in MLS? What was the one thing that you would change? And and I think 18 of the 23 players said travel. They said, we need to get charter flights. Well, um, you know, that's what I wrote. MLS never challenged the veracity of it. They just thought it gave the the league a black eye. I'm totally different. I thought it showed the league going through some growing pains. And I wrote another column just a couple weeks ago about how I think the MLS talent pool – for the national team is a little shallow right now, which right. is why half the starters of the national team come from Europe. Um, people were talking, MLS hated that story too, and they went ballistic again. But you know what? That story got people talking about MLS. It got them looking at it. I, I got heard from a lot of people that disagreed with me, and that's fine. The point is people were talking uh, whereas if you write something like, oh, my gosh, MLS is the greatest league in the history of uh, organized sports. Isn't this terrific? Right. Then I get a call from New York and saying, you really know your stuff. But fans look at that and say, what are you talking about? You're an idiot. So just be honest. Let the chips fall where they may. 
tell me that Robbie Keane is injured, and then we'll go on from that. And, and if he's not injured, then then we'll we'll handle that too. Let's just be honest and let's not get into these guessing games. You know, is Jossi really hurt? Uh, when you say he's not hurt, you know, let's let's just be honest and move forward, and everyone will have a good time. And then when we come out at the other end, at least we'll know how we got there. Yeah, no, it, it is, and and I'm with you, Kevin. I th- personally, I think that LA Galaxy fans deserve to know this information, which is one of the reasons that you know I wanted you on this podcast is because I wanted to make sure that we're getting everybody, you know, the most up to date, you know, informative, uh, you know, not coming from MLS or from the team information, because all that stuff that comes out of MLS or out of the LA Galaxy is all obviously colored and favored towards MLS and the LA Galaxy, as it should be. Um, because I wouldn't expect anything different. You know, if, if I'm going to, if I'm writing about my own company and what I do, then I'm going to tell you it's the greatest thing in the whole wide world. And you've never seen anything as great as this. All right. You know, there's, there's something to that, but you know, with here, we're trying to look at something and say, what does it look like? What does it sound like? And then give our opinions sort of based off of the, the information that we're able to gather. And with the LA galaxy this year, I think it's going to be, um, you know, eye opening. I don't think it's not all going to be, you know, perfect golden rainbow and you know everything's not going to be wonderful in 2017 there are going to be some ups and downs in fact people are already asking and and i should get to some of these questions that we got on twitter but um already jose (laughs) excuse me jose was asking you know uh everybody's sort of saying that uh kurt anolfo will have a short leash quote unquote a short leash for this season how short is a short leash for kurt anolfo kevin if the la galaxy come out and pull a bruce arena start which is come out slowly um, you know, don't really put anything together and don't really get going until, you know, July or August. Um, does that put Kurt Anolfo in the hot seat? And it's a question that I think is warranted from the fact that everybody knows what Kurt Anolfo's uh, previous MLS record is and that that is going to be held up as sort of a, a marker of he's got to be better than that. And this is the LA Galaxy now and they're better than that. And it doesn't matter who the players are on the field. Kurt Anolfo is going to have to get results. Well, I want to go back to what you said earlier. You said if, you, if with your company you would not, you know, you would want to tell me when your company is is the greatest company, and that's what MLS is doing. I would look at it from the other side and say, what about the customers? Don't the customers deserve to be told the truth? They do. Yes, you as the as the owner of the company want your company to be looked at in the best light, but you also have to be honest with your customers. And if you're not going to have Jesse's artists on the field, uh, or if he's had an operation, then I think. You know, you need to put that out there. But in answer to your question, it's funny because it's the same topic we're talking on. Uh, do we believe what the galaxy is telling us? And what the galaxy is telling us, not in so many words, but in in the way that they've remade this this team, is they think the Galaxy Two and the Academy system is the way to build for the future. I think everyone will agree it's not going to happen in one year, but that the guys they have in place, Pete Viannis, uh, Chris Klein, and, and Kurt Anoffo all came out of the academy system. Um, and, and these guys know that. And I think you need to give them time. So I don't think, I don't think Kurt, in my mind, Kurt doesn't have a short leash at all. I think if the galaxy are truly committed to this, I think they should go in with their eyes open and realize that this could take some time, that these young players are going to make mistakes and they need to, to be patient with them. Um, but it is going to be extremely difficult. This is the most successful franchise in the history of Major League Soccer. This is the marquee franchise in the league. Um, it, it's the it's the you know it's the one that everyone's always pointed to. And so it's not a team that is a 500 team. And if they struggle and they're not playing well and they are a 500 team, I think there's going to you know there's going to be people out in the street with pitchforks and torches. Right. It, it, at that point, that's when the Galaxy need to step up and say, look. This is a long-term project. Kurt is our guy. And that's what they keep saying. They keep saying it over and over again. Kurt is the guy. We did a nationwide search. We got calls from people in Europe. Kurt is the guy to lead this project forward. The timing is really unfortunate. LAFC is coming in next year, probably with uh, Javier Hernandez as as the leader of their team. Um, But if the Galaxy are really committed to this new model – uh, I think Kurt, it doesn't have a short lease. I think Kurt has a little bit of time to figure this out. I, I think it's going to be unbelievably interesting. I, I think that there has to be some sort of accountability for, for Kurt and Alfo, but I also think that there has to be accountability for the front office and the position that they put it. This isn't Bruce Arena that we have now where he was basically in charge of all the moves that happened and nothing happened without his say. So basically you could always point back to Bruce when something didn't go wrong, Kevin. Uh, this one is going to be more nuanced. We're going to have to figure out exactly whose fault this is and if, if things go badly 
badly, or even if things go well, who to put the success on. I mean, ultimately, the club succeeds as a whole, and they probably fail as individuals. I mean, that's usually how it goes with any types of sports. Um, if the club is winning, it's everybody. Good job, everybody. You did a wonderful job. And when it's losing, it's this guy's fault, all right? That's sort of how it yeah, goes. Yeah, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think Chris Klein was very uh, comfortable letting Bruce, you know, get the credit and, and the blame. But, I mean, I think Chris was happy sort of being in the background. Um, the problem with this, I think if the team does well, I, I think you're going to see Kurt get a lot of the credit. Just the, That just happens with coaches in all sports. But if things go south, um, you know, the three people we talked about, Chris Klein and, and, and Pete Vianis and, and Kurt Anoffa, who put this team together, essentially, or at least were agreed on the strategy, along with Dan Beckerman, I think you're going to have to really, uh, you know, if the f- people start pointing fingers at one another saying, I signed the best player and you're not using them the right way, or right. Uh, you didn't get me the player I wanted, if fingers start getting pointed, that's when it gets really ugly. That's when they're, they're going to have to tear this up and say, we're gonna, we need to start over again. But if everyone could stay on the same page and work together as they have, you know, these guys are not new. None of these players or none of these uh, people we're talking about just showed up yesterday. They've been here right. for years and they've worked together. If they can continue to work together, I think it has a chance to succeed. I would be surprised if it succeeded this year. Um, but I think it can succeed down the road. They just need to be patient. And that's why, in my mind, I don't know what uh, the terms of Kern contract are. It probably be, would be smart if it was a short-term contract to see if this works. But I, I think they need to give him some time, and he deserves that. He's taken over a, a team that's going in an entirely different direction after 21 years. You can't turn a cruise ship around you know, in a cul-de-sac. You need some time and some space. That's my new favorite thing you've ever said. You can't turn a cruise ship around <laughs> on a cul-de-sac. I'm going to remember that one. Uh, we got, we got uh, some other questions. Uh, Oscar asked, and it's right along the terms of what we're talking about, is success for the LA Galaxy. He says, should we use this year as an experiment year? Or look at it as a championship or bust. He goes, from a fan's perspective, obviously, because the team expects championships. I mean, if you're going to talk to anybody on the team, they're going to say, we expect to win an MLS Cup. Um, but what should the fans expect from this year, from the LA Galaxy? What would be considered success for the Galaxy, Kevin? Well, I think for the fans, I think you should set your sights on coming out and seeing some really good, exciting players and yes, you want to see them win, and I think the Galaxy are going to win more than they lose, but no, it's not a championship or bust year. I think that was last year. I thought right. last year was a championship or bust year because you had some high-paid players that were clearly in their last years, and you, 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 you know, Bruce did a great job pulling in players like Van Damme and Nigel DeJong, and when the year started, I definitely thought that this was uh, a year that the Galaxy had to win, and they didn't. Again, I think with Kurt Anoffel's team, you need to be a little bit more patient. I think fans will see some great soccer. Again, I don't know that they'll see a lot of wins. I think if the Galaxy make the playoffs, I think that should be a considered be considered a success. And even if they don't, and and that sounds funny because we're talking about the Galaxy. You right. know, when the New York Yankees, um, uh, you know, lose Derek Jeter and Jorge Posada and other players to retirement, they don't go to spring training saying, "Hey, you know, we just hope to finish fifth this year." Right. You know, they they go to spring training saying we're going to win, and that's the way the Galaxy is looking at, it, and that's the way they should. Realistically, I think that this is a team that's going to be a few games over 500. Um, you know, they they probably make the playoffs. I don't know that they'll stick around a lot. But the great thing about the MLS playoffs, look at Portland and then Seattle last year. Once you get in, you know, that, that's kind of the Willy Wonka's golden ticket, you know, and then you write your own story from there. All you got to do is get hot for a week or two. And, and the Galaxy may be. It, that's a, a huge advantage the Galaxy has. They may be youthful enough that when they get to the to the playoffs, that's when they're really going to gel. Um, but yeah, you know, if you're if you're the fans, come on out, have a good time, look for you know, see some great soccer, but don't get hung up in the results. Like you know, I think last year there was that feeling every time the Galaxy lost, it was you know people were going to slit their wrists. Uh, this team is not like that. You know, it, you have to look at it for what it is. It's a, a, a in my mind, it's a rebuilding. But they're rebuilding with guys like Giassi's artist, Jermaine Jones, Sebastian Legette, Giovanni Dos Santos, four national team stars. So, you know, there's there's a, there's a reason to be hopeful. Maybe I'm completely wrong. It's not the first time today that I would have been wrong. <laughs> yeah, it won't even be the, the last time you're probably wrong today. <laughs> uh, I think that for LA Galaxy fans, and I've, I've, known, uh, I've known enough of them for a long time, and I know you guys, I know my listeners, um, there are, you're expecting MLS Cup. I mean, that's in the bottom line. Now, how realistic is that? I don't know. I don't know. This is the whole problem is we're, we're in this preseason sort of uh, like title wave of, you know, emotion where everybody doesn't know really what the team looks like. I have no idea what this team looks like. I don't even know who the starters are going to be right now on the first day. I have some good ideas. 
But what I like from this team is their ability to play, play quickly so far that I've been able to see, uh, to be athletic because they're young, to run. Maybe they'll be able to run teams into the ground. Maybe these guys... Um, you know, will succeed on a lot of their physical attributes and then use some of those veterans uh, like Jermaine Jones and Romain Alessandrini um, and Yella Van Dam and Ashley Cole to outsmart some of their opponents as well. And if they can do that, just even put a couple of those together, um, I've seen, you know, little inklings of wonderful, beautiful, so almost Tiki Taco, as they like to call it at LA Galaxy Land, uh, Tiki Taco passing, and all of those things could come together and put together a, a great, it's MLS, anybody can win MLS Cup, it, it doesn't mean anything, like you said, Kevin, you get to the playoffs, you can win MLS Cup, so is this LA Galaxy team, guess what, Vegas, because Vegas is not paying any attention, uh, has the LA Galaxy, I think, favored to win MLS Cup again, which is just, you know, what it's probably one of those things, hey, they haven't won it in a couple of years, so we better go ahead and put them down as, well, as, as that, one of the favorites. I'm going to go ahead and say that's wildly wrong. But, uh, <laughs> I think you're, so, too. You're, you're right about the guy. This could be the fastest team in MLS history. This is the, These guys have a legitimate 400-meter relay team, you know, when you put Boateng and, and, right. and Ari Lasseter and some of those guys out there. You know, the second fastest guy on the team, and I know this because yep. I saw them. They had a race last year. Yep. Clement Diop is the second fastest guy on the team. And he's the, behind, he's uh, the second uh, string goalkeeper. Yeah. He's a goalie. Yep. Yeah. So uh, that's how that's how much speed this team has. Um, uh, but, again, you know, I'm just going to go back. Back and say there has to be some patience. David Villa, uh, uh, the lead reigning MVP, was at the media day, and he said the great thing about MLS is on opening day, 22 teams have a chance to win. He said when when he played in Spain, you started the season, and 15 teams knew they had no shot at all. Um, that's not the, the way it is in MLS. 22 teams have a shot on opening day, and then you get to the playoffs. What uh, you know, 12 teams. And all 12 of those teams can win. You could have a team with a great record and a, and a losing uh, and a team playing a losing a team with a losing record. And the way the MLS playoffs are set up, it's such a crapshoot that anyone can win. And, and that is a good thing about MLS, not a bad thing. So uh, my feeling is the Galaxy's not going to be the dominant team it was in the past. But if they can get to the playoffs, they have a really good shot because of the youth and, and the, the exuberance of those guys when they get to the postseason. All right, I'm going to finish up on an email from, I'm going to call Brian. Brian emailed to us, and I just got it as we were recording the show. Uh, Brian emails us from Huntington Beach, California. He was at training. So, Brian, you were the insider today. We appreciate you uh, emailing, but he was at training this morning. They had a special training. Some people were invited to go and see it. Uh, it was Romain Alessandrini's first training. And so this is what Brian writes in his little report on the training session that happened on Monday morning. He says, strong-looking light practice this morning. Uh, Romain Main Allison Zrini looking strong with his free kicks into the box. Looks like the starters are understanding each other's moves and styles. Still concerned about our depth. Dan Kennedy and Baggio not on the practice pitch today. I'm liking Jermaine Jones and Giovanni Dos Santos. Friendship on the pitch today. Talking and joking like long-lost friends. Always like the chemistry stuff. Uh, McBean looking strong in the box. And, and then he goes on. He says, hey, enough with this AJ stuff. I loved him on the LA Galaxy, but it's time to move forward with who we have now. Thanks for all you do, Josh, and the rest of the COG team. Uh, and then he sent me a picture of almost Almost the entire team, um, individual pictures of almost the entire team that uh, that he got to take pictures with, um, and it, it looks like maybe his, I'm going to say his daughter, and then he's going to yell at me because it's like his girlfriend or something like that. So Brian, thank you for sending this in. Uh, a little insider report there from training this morning uh, as the LA Galaxies opened their preseason, uh, or excuse me, uh, came back from Santa Barbara to open this week of training. They play RSL on Tuesday um, at, I believe, 12 p.m. I believe that was what the schedule said yes. out there. Yes, yeah. yep, 12 p.m. So 12 p.m. They'll play RSL closed door scrimmage. I'm going to try to get there. I don't think that's going to happen, but regardless, look for that. If, if I am there, I'll have some insights on our Thursday show on that. And then the LA Galaxy will host the Portland Timbers on Saturday. This is the game that is on Spectrum Sportsnet. It's at 8 p.m. at StubHub Center. And then Sunday is the season ticket member rally. Um, I'm still planning on being there in some capacity. I'm going to figure out exactly what that means, and I will let you know on the Thursday show exactly how I will be there, and uh, and hopefully I'll get to see some of you out there. So that's what you, we... You know what? That yeah. was a great report by Brian from practice. Far better than anything I've ever done from practice that was uh that was tremendous and you know I agree with you but I disagree with you Brian on the AJ De La Garza thing yes it's time to move on he's not here I do think that there's a lot of upside to that trade as we mentioned earlier you got two midfielders in exchange for your fifth defender um they cleared a lot of salary they can do a lot of other things during the year a lot of upside to that trade but it's AJ De La Garza he was the the you know just did so many things for this franchise on and off the field 
uh, and you know that they, they need him. They, they need it right back right now. So uh, I agree with you. You know he's gone. There's not much you can do with it. But anytime a defender makes an error, or anytime there's an injury in the back line, you can bet you're going to hear people bring up AJ Delagarza's <laughs> name, and it, uh, that'll that'll go on for a while. It, it's going to be the Jaime Pinedo would have saved that, and uh, let's see what what other ones have exactly. Done? Or, or exactly. Landon Donovan would have scored that. Robbie Keane would have scored that. One of those things, uh, type of things, and that's what it's going to be. And you know, ultimately here, you know, I'm. Kind Kind of with Brian, it, it, one of the reasons that it continues to be such an issue is because there's nothing really to to analyze yet because there aren't any games being played. And so it continues to be just one of these focus areas that we talk about a team that lacks depth and they traded away one of the guys who gave them probably the most depth on one guy could cover four positions. That's the most depth you can pretty much get out of a player. Um, on on a team, and so that's one of the reasons that it'll continue to be a highlight, but I think as this team starts playing, and you get to see Rafa Garcia start playing, then it'll be less about AJ De La Garza, more about Rafa, more about the LA Galaxy, and, and that'll start to change a little bit. So Well, here's, here's where Brian's right. AJ De La Garza is not coming back. They're not going <laughs> to undo that trade, and you can't, you know, you hear players talk about that all the time. I can only control what I can control. They can't control where AJ De La Garza is, so it, he's absolutely right. You know, you have to move on but I have a feeling that that's going to take a little longer than Brian might wish. Well, Kevin, every time we sit down to do a podcast, I keep saying we're going to do about a half an hour, and every time so far we've gone almost an hour every single time. So uh, I guess that's that's kind of it. That's, that's my way of saying we're done. We're done for today. The LA Galaxy have two preseason games to round out their preseason schedule. Saturday's it. That's it. No more preseason games. That's it. The next game is March 4th against FC Dallas, the uh, Western or the the Western Conference champion, or excuse me, the Western Conference leaders and the Supporter Shield champions are coming into StubHub Center on March 4th. That's when this whole thing will start. Finally, we'll get to talk about things that involve actual games and not just preseason madness that doesn't matter because you should see a typical starting lineup on Saturday against the Portland Timbers, and you should see those guys go 80 to 90 minutes. I mean, realistically, these guys should be game ready by now, and I think Kernan Awful has these guys peaking in the right way. So if You know what? I, yeah. I'm sure Kernan Awful, when he looks at the opener, he's going to say, God, I wish I had more time to get ready, but I can't wait to get started. Um, you know, he's he circled this date on his calendar a long time ago. Yeah, he seems to have, and I think that goes the same for all the players. They're tired of playing games that don't matter for the most part. Um, yep. Already now. They're, they're already done with it. They're already done with all this traveling to Vegas, going to Santa Barbara. They're done. Let's get the season started with, and realistically, you know, the rest of the year now begins on March 4th. So we're counting down to that. We'll have another live show on Thursday night. Um, that way we can uh, we can get you ready for the Saturday game and then go over all the news that we've learned throughout the week. All right, Kevin, anything else? That's it. All right. Thank you. No problems. All right, if you're looking for Kevin Baxter... On Twitter, at KBaxter11, and of course, go to LATimes.com and follow Kevin's writings there. Covers soccer, covers hockey sometimes with the Kings as well, so make sure you follow him, at KBaxter11. If you're looking for me on Twitter, at Jay Guessman, J-G-U-E-S-M-A-N, and of course, Corner of the Galaxy is where you can find all of my writings, all of our podcasts, our live shows, everything else, cornerofthegalaxy.com. All right, for Mr. Kevin Baxter, I'm Josh Guessman. We hope everybody has a wonderful day or night, wherever you're listening to us, and we will catch you next week. You've been listening to the Corner of the Galaxy from the Box podcast on cornerofthegalaxy.com. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Galaxy Podcast. And be sure to check out and subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, and Facebook by searching for Corner of the Galaxy. And for all of your independent LA Galaxy news, discussion, and entertainment, including this podcast, head on over to cornerofthegalaxy.com. Fans, thanks for listening. We ask that you be kind and courteous to your neighbors as you leave the podcast. We thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you again. Until then, I'm Michael Araujo, and on behalf of the entire Corner of the Galaxy crew, goodbye, everybody.